in the field of environment, especially on water, oceans, and so on. And she will present something dealing with oceans, I think. Eh? Coastal zone. Ah, coastal zones. Coastal zone. It was uh, a subject very much treated in our collaboration, also with exactly. Russian. And exactly. so I thank you very much for your uh, presence for the first time in this group thank and you. for your contribution to the success of the initiative. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's really quite exciting for me this morning because uh, the previous speakers have actually touched on a lot of the points in my presentation. So even though it's my first time here uh, and I'm delighted to be here, it's quite nice to see that we're obviously on the same wavelength. So I will be talking this morning about global change and coastal vulnerability because I believe that vulnerability and sustainability are uh, intimately linked. And I'm focusing on the coastal zone because it's a very important part of the Earth's system. So first of all, I'd really like to thank uh, the organizers and uh, especially uh, Luigi for inviting me, but also all the people who have contributed to make this conference and this event in Ravenna a success. I've wanted to come here several years and this is the first year I've been able to come here and I'm really uh, pleased to be here. So the coast is a very complex component of the Earth system and I have a little examination here because I'm also a professor. So do you recognize this coastline? Yes, it's the coastline? Uh, from not far. Not, not far, far from here, yes. <laughs> but I, I quite like the parallel with this figure because it really illustrates how complex um, the coast is and what an important component of the Earth system it is. And you also showed this uh, light map of, uh, of the world. Of the world. And I'm concentrating on Europe because it really shows very nicely the coastline um, and the concentration of people who live in the coastline. Uh, it, the coast is where vulnerable ecosystems but also human societies are concentrated. It represents only 10% of the area of the surface of the world. You remember that map that uh, you showed with the areas that we can live in, the areas we can inhabit, but actually 50% of the world population, and that's 3.5 billion now, um, choose to live in the coastal zone. So we concentrate our vulnerability <coughs> in this zone. And there's lots of reasons why we do that. So the, um, actually, this is not the latest version of my presentation. Do you mind if I just backtrack? Because there seems to have been a change this is the, the latest presentation should be in here. Who loaded this presentation up? Uh, Maximo, please, if you can see. That I loaded it up this morning. And this is not the version I wanted to present. OK, I, I can do it, but it's not, as, it's not as relevant. You, you, you can yes. use your thing. And right. And yes. Right. If you yes. don't mind. Yes. They loaded the presentation I sent three weeks ago, <laughs> <laughs> which is not so relevant. Possibly I'm short because I'm not like a bit. No, not like a bit. Sorry about this. I tried to upload it this morning, but it obviously didn't go through properly. <laughs> you may sing. You may sing something. <laughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so now we're back on track, yes. Uh -huh. Good. 
So I wanted to talk about the importance of the coastal zone. And it really is a unique component of the Earth system because it's where land, ocean, and atmosphere all come together. And when people ask me why I'm now working with uh, an institute of atmospheric research, although I'm an oceanographer, it's because the ocean and the atmosphere are in contact for 70% of the Earth's surface. So there's a really close coupling, and we need to really learn more about that. But also the welfare and the livelihoods of the coastal population are very, very important. A lot of our wealth comes from the coastal, the coastal zone, and we derive a lot of benefits from it. We have lots of goods and services from the coastal zone that support our economy, and also multiple <coughs> human activities associated with the coastal zone. And these activities are changing from the traditional activities like fisheries to the more uh, recent activities such as offshore energy. So our coasts are very valuable, but they're also vul very vulnerable systems. They're valuable ecosystems. They give us valuable ecosystem services, valuable activities such as tourism, aquaculture, and fisheries. But they're also subject to multiple pressures. And they're the place where some of these contradictions that you were talking about and these contradictions between economy and ecology are all happening. So, like yourself, I prefer to talk about global change rather than climate change because our world and the coastal zone is changing very, very rapidly and it's not just about climate change, although climate change is very important. And all these stresses, they contribute to our coastal vulnerability. So I've tried to divide some of these stress stresses that are changing the coast into two lists, the global change and the climate change. And we'll address the climate change because that's the ones we're more familiar with first. They're things like sea surface temperature, which is now well documented from satellite imagery. Also sea level rise, also well documented from altimetry. Evaporation, changes in evaporation and rainfall, Increased storminess, which uh, is being more and more documented, not necessarily the frequency of storms, but the intensity of storms, and ocean acidification. On the other hand, we have global change, and that's more things to do with the human dimension. Things like this demographic movement to the coast, the number of people who are now concentrating and living on the coast. These large cities and um, agglomerations along the coast. So many of the world's megacities are megacities in the coastal zone. The three top ones in, in the world rankings are in the coastal zone. Um, and also changes in the catchment. You showed very nicely the maps of how the forestry was changing and the land use, but also changes at the coast itself. And changes in relative sea level are very important. It's not just the sea level rising, but it's also the land sinking. And this is uh, causing problems all over the world and nowhere more obviously than nearby in Venice, where we have these aqua alta events occurring. But also, there are changes in morphology and hydrology. And uh, this is not a picture of the Italian coast, but it could be because I'm sure there are many places like this along the Italian coast where human beings have put a construction for a good reason. There were good reasons to put this construction uh, to, for the access to a port, but it was done without considering the sediment transport. So here on this side, you can see the sediment is accumulating, and here on this side, you can see the erosion. And it's just unfortunate that the actual urban development is on the side that's eroding and that this area has only one or two houses. But there are changes in populations, urbanization and tourism on the coast means that we're surrounding some of our coastal areas with inhabitation. And we really need to start thinking about residential control zones because these people are actually in a very vulnerable area. So just to summarize global change in coasts, 
we have the problem of sea level, we have the problem of morphology, this erosion and deposition, problems with uh, the water cycle, over-exploitation of our coastal aquifers causing salination. Also, lots of changes in the key environmental variables that control the whole Earth system. Things like temperature, things like oxygen, things like pH. Who would have thought we could change the pH of the ocean? And also changes in bio biochemical cycles, for instance, the nitrogen cycle and the phosphorus cycle. All these are affecting the ecosystem function, and eventually, of course, this affects our economy, because much of our economy depends on the proper ecosystem function. And when our economy is affected, then so is our society. So it's important for us to consider not just the ecological environmental aspects, but also to look at the economic aspects and to look also at the societal aspects. We have to work as teams, not just as natural scientists. And this is a reason why I, now I can tell my, my uh, head of my institute that the center I'm working in is an oxymoron because it's a center for ecology and economy. So um, I'm looking forward to being able to tell him that uh, the center is an oxymoron and we need to change our name. So um, what is causing this uh, coastal vulnerability? Uh, there are lots of natural hazards, of course. And these natural hazards are multiple. There's like the hydrometeorological hazards, such as cyclones and hurricanes, and geohazards, such as earthquakes and tsunamis. All these contribute to coastal vulnerability. And there are lots and lots of examples of this, but just to give you an idea of how severe some of these events are, this is not a very recent example. It's from 1970, so you know it's within most of the people in this room's uh, living memory. Half a million people were killed in this, as a result of this one storm. There was a 10-meter storm surge. So these events are not trivial. And floods are happening not just in the coastal zone, but they're often associated with river mouth systems. And there are very, very severe floods. And the industry, especially the insurance industry, is looking at these patterns with a lot of care. They're very Im interested in this. Uh, 2011 was a disastrous year for the uh, insurance industry. So river mouth systems are of particular interest for lots of reasons. First of all, they're sinking. Um, this is a plug for, this is one of the best papers I've read in the last decade. I would advise anybody who hasn't read it to download it and, and really enjoy it. It's a wonderful paper. And he illustrates very well that many of the world deltas that are associated with some great population densities are sinking. And they're sinking for all sorts of reasons. But a lot of them are to do with the extraction of water and also the retention of sediment by dams. And of course, this means that we have flooding. There were dramatic floods in Bangkok in October uh, 2011. But last week when I was in the UK, they were reporting flooding all over the, in the, in the areas where there are rivers and the rivers are being choked and not allowed the normal floodplain. Earthquakes and tsunamis, of course, these are geohazards, much more difficult for us to manage. All we can do is make sure that we don't develop in the areas that are so vulnerable to them, and also that we don't hide behind false defenses. I was at a conference in July in, um, in uh, Japan, and they were talking about the false security that was given by a seawall of just three meters, but then when the tsunami came, it was nearly 13 meters in this particular area. So it totally overtopped. We can't build 13 meter walls around all our coastal zone. We have to move back out of danger's way. Coastal vulnerability doesn't look at GDP. Uh, it can affect people in Bangladesh, and it can affect people in the United States. Coastal populations are vulnerable, whether they're in rich countries or whether they're in poor countries. What happens is usually that in rich countries, there is 
more loss of property, more loss of the economy, and unfortunately, in poor countries, there is more loss of life. But we're vulnerable in both places. What I've learned working with social scientists is that vulnerable societies and populations exist the world over, but some societies are more vulnerable and some societies are more resilient than others. And so we need to work with uh, sociologists to understand this, what makes our society vulnerable, what makes it more resilient. And I learned this also from a medical doctor who was sent to Banda Aceh just after the tsunami. And he came back and he said to me, Alice, these people don't need a medical doctor. They're either survived and they're okay, they have bruises or something, or they're dead and I can't do anything for them. What they need are psychologists because they're so traumatized. And I also learned from uh, colleagues who went and looked at the reconstruction after Banda Aceh, there, there was so much um, money given to, the, to rebuilding the villages, but you cannot rebuild the societies if you have key members of the society that are missing. People like the teacher in the village or the doctor in the village. The society cannot reform itself if these key m actors are missing. Sometimes it's key infrastructure. So if a causeway or a certain bridge is missing, then also reconstruction of property of houses is not sufficient. We need to understand these things. So I've been talking about these extreme hazardous events, but coastal vulnerability has another that less, less dramatic but not less damaging aspect. And this detrimental environmental change, this constant erosion of our environment that we are implicated in, in our everyday life, we all are responsible for this. Every time we flush the toilet, we flush water that you can brush your teeth with. It's the same quality. Our society demands that the water we flush our toilet with and the water we brush our teeth with is of the same quality. So we're all responsible for this. And think about it next time you flush the toilet. <laughs> um, but we also are responsible for some acute hazards, man-made coastal hazards, such as oil spills and such as radioactive contamination. So this is a big problem and we all share this responsibility. Fukushima was hiding behind this three meter wall and the wave just overwhelmed the wall. So why is this important? Um, because these hazards, we can compute, we can use statistics to predict the probability and also to calculate the risk of populations, vulnerable populations. And this is very important for environment agencies, but also for the insurance sector. The insurance sector had massive losses in 2011, but it looks like 2012 is a better year. So we have the hazards, we can calculate the risk, and we know what the vulnerability is. But what do we do? The call for action. We can't carry on just studying the problem. We need to try to solve it. We also need to understand how complex and how interrelated these things are. We were talking about the Convention for Biodiversity. We now understand that changes in ecosystem function, for instance, eutrophication, changing seagrass meadows to opportunistic green algae, can have really severe consequences to the vulnerability because the seagrass is actually holding the sediment. And that's true also of salt marshes. It's true of mangroves. It's true of coral reefs. We've seen in the tsunamis that areas that have destroyed their mangrove are much more vulnerable than areas that have maintained their mangroves. We're changing our land use and we're putting some of our vital infrastructure in silly areas. So this is the airport near Faro. And what they did was they constructed the airport in the wetland. And if you go to Venice and you land in Venice, you will see they made the same decision. And if you go to Barcelona and you land in Barcelona, all over the world now when I'm landing, I think, oh, is that wetland? <laughs> or was it wetland? 
And you'll be surprised. I want to actually do a study of the number of airports that are in wetland areas. And we know what wetlands are. They're areas that get naturally flooded. That's why we call them wetlands. Maybe not the best idea to put your airports there. And also not a good idea to put big walls around airports because the air airplanes need to get low. So not such a wise decision for the planning. So in summary, we have vulnerability to natural hazards such as environmental vulnerability due to erosion, ecological vulnerability, the loss of key organisms like seagrasses or mangroves, the vulnerability of ecosystem goods when our fishing resources collapse, for instance, because of overexploitation, or un underestimating this carrion capacity, the yield we can extract is overestimated. Also, the vulnerability of our ecosystem services. How much nitrogen can we pump into this system? <coughs> the vulnerability to man-made hazards include things like technological vulnerability, where we put our key infrastructure, where do, should we put our airports, where should we put our nuclear power stations, social vulnerability, and also the link to some of our uh, traditional activities. In Portugal now, a lot of the villages near where I live are suffering because the, the fisheries are collapsing, but the people Historically, that's all they've ever done is fish. And now they, they feel that a big part of their culture has been destroyed, not just their job. There's the economic uh, vulnerability when we depend completely on one aspect. So if all your, all your area just depends on tourism and there's an oil spill on the beach, then you're in big trouble. And there's governance vulnerability when there is political vulnerability, when there's administrative vulnerability, and that's why we must work with the people also who represent the regions and who are the political players and the decision makers. We can work with them, we can help them, and they can also help us by telling us what, they would, what are the questions they would like us to address. So this is my 21st century challenge to coastal vulnerability. Uh, okay, we're all scientists here and we like to study the problem, but we also should be contributing to solving the problem. We need to pass to action. And we can't do this on our own because scientists are not the decision makers. We need to enter in a partnership with the stakeholders, with the managers, with the decision makers, and also with the citizens, because the public is also very interested and very worried about a lot of these aspects. So how can we do that? And what can we do? Well, we need to raise awareness of what the problems are. What is sustainability? What is vulnerability? We need to enhance preparedness. We need to build resilience into the system to work with the decision makers and work with the stakeholders to better prepare our society. And if they're aware and they're prepared, they will make decisions themselves. They won't necessarily want to live in a very vulnerable area if they really understand what the risks are. We also can provide forecasting and early warnings. And meteorology is the perfect example of how science can serve the t citizen every day. We all consult the meteorological, what's going to happen, especially if you live in England. You, you know, should I take my umbrella or should I take sunblock? You're not quite sure. You know, sunblock or umbrella? Um, and uh, should I cancel the barbecue? Um, should I go for a picnic today because it's the only sunny day this summer? So we, we meteorology really, it's a global network they get the data and they get the information to us within 24 hours. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, we also need to plan, inform, and train. We need to train our citizens what to do in these vulnerable situations. There was tragic loss of life, tragic loss of life in Japan. The word tsunami is a Japanese name. They all knew the risk. But when the warning came, 
they decided that they would go to the school to see if their child was okay, they would go to see if the grandparent was okay, and they didn't realize they only had 35 minutes to evacuate, and most people took more than 30 minutes to, oh, well, I have to take my mobile phone, <laughs> you know? Maybe I should pack my jewelry. Um, we really need to train people better, and the Japanese were shocked at how many people took the wrong decision and didn't evacuate. We also need to improve our risk governance, and we can only do that in partnership with the decision makers and the local governance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to everyone in the conference who made this event possible. The generous sponsors, because these are very difficult times to raise money to hold an expensive event like this. And thank you, Luigi. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry about the wrong presentation at first. No, no, it's not wrong. It's very, it's very good. I think uh, all the people in this room, uh, they will appreciate very much because it was very clear. And I, I made only a very small comment. Please. We really need awareness about this problem. Awareness. Uh, awareness. And this is the starting point to educate people. And the education in this field is very, very important. And the target group should be young people, especially. Of course. <laughs> OK, thank you very much thank again, you. Alice. We appreciate it very much. Now, Professor Casal is coming, and uh, we will change completely okay. the context, uh, even if uh, there are str very, very strong connections between uh, the theme that will be analyzed by Professor Casali, presenting uh, how we can make diagnosis and conservation of cultural heritage. For Ravenna, is particularly important because it's full of uh, uh, heritage in the artistic field. There is also some uh, courses, uh, university courses in, in Ravenna, concerning this kind of uh, techniques. So. I uh, thank you very much as the organizers, Luigi in particular, for having invited me to speak uh, about these uh, physical techniques in support of uh, conservation and restoration of uh, cultural heritage assets. I, uh, I, I know that uh, after the wonderful presentation of Mrs. Newton, my English will be dramatically poor. <laughs> much better than my Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, let's try to, to find my presentation. Uh, Dov'è? Vai sul 27 ore, aspetta che ce l'ho. Grazie. Dopo dovrebbe essere qua, no? Sì. Messa qua. Sì. Apro questa qua? Sì. Beh. Well. Uh, medicine, it is well known that the medicine has had an impressive improvement uh, by the new diagnostic technique uh, as computer tomography, positron emission tomography, nuclear magnetic resonance, and so on. The same type of techniques are more and more used also in support of cultural heritage set now. My brief presentation will show some application of uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, between uh, uh, all the, the technique, I have chosen only the electromagnetic from infrared to X-rays for helping the conservation and recovery of some masterpieces. Here there is a, a drawing of uh, a, a section of uh, a table, a painted table, ultraviolet uh, stops uh, in uh, the surface painting visible on the pigment, infrared past the pigments, and uh, try to see if uh, there are some drawing for the preparation, and X-ray passes through the, the table. Now I will give uh, an example of uh, infrared reflectography. The image uh, 
saw the photos of an old palimpsest damaged during a fire occurred in uh, 1904 in the University Library of Turin. Irradiating uh, the document with uh, infrared light uh, by using a suitable camera, it is possible to read the original text in both sizes of, of the palimpsest. Another technique is uh, the X-ray fluorescence. The X-ray fluorescence is a, a technique which uses uh, low, weak uh, X-rays. When an element is irradiated by X-ray beam, it receives a characteristic secondary or fluorescent radiation typical of the element. The phenomenon is widely used for elemental analysis and chemical analysis in many fields, including painting. One can well define uh, surface uh, elements deriving from air pollution, like uh, sulfur, chlorine, uh, calcium, and so on, Element, uh, elements coming from previous restoration and element present in the pigment used by the artists. As an example, I will uh, show the uh, analysis done in uh, Padua at Cappella of Strovegni on frescoes of Giotto. The fresco should be washed to polished from sulfur but uh, how deep uh, the cleaning should go for not damaging the printing is the problem. The image of the experimental setup, uh, there is uh, an X-ray tube, a small X-ray tube, the detector of the uh, fluorescence radiation and multi-channel analyzer to, define, to find the, uh, the elements present on the surface. <coughs> In uh, this slide, uh, the higher curves uh, is related to the sulfur content uh, without washing. The second is after a uh, five minute uh, washing by a uh, Japanese paper. The third one is after 10 minutes washing, a fit after 15 uh, minutes washing. At this point, uh, it was decided to suspend the washing for not damaging uh, the, uh, the fresco. Another technique is uh, the uh, X-ray tomography. At the Department of Physics, we have developed many uh, uh, experimental sets just uh, for uh, 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 analyzing some uh, uh, cultural heritage object. It is a, a scheme of uh, the three-dimensional tomography with uh, a, a cone beam uh, ray. It is an X-ray, uh, is, uh, um, is uh, shaped as a form of cone, and uh, the object is irradiated. <coughs> you can uh, see here the, uh, the setup. Here is an object, it's rotated on a rotating uh, table. An image is uh, uh, created by the X-ray beam on a scintillating layer and a, a camera, frequently an intensified camera, can uh, read the, uh, the, the image. As an example, I will show you the computer tomography of uh, a cat of uh, a better, of a, a cat-shaped coffin containing an Egyptian mummy of cat. This was done in collaboration with the Archaeological Museum <coughs> in Bologna. They are, you, see, you, can, you can see the different uh, projection, and by a particular software, you can reconstruct the virtual object in three dimensions. You can open the coffin and to extract uh, the skeleton of the cat uh, and to analyze the cat and the, the skeleton without touching. Now uh, we saw an important uh, uh, restoration uh, uh, program concerning the uh, Madonna del Cardellino of Raffaello. Madonna del Cardellino, the Colfinch, so-called Colfinch uh, Madonna, 
was damaged by the falling down of the houses where it was settled and it broke in 17 pieces that were immediately nailed in a rough way. A few years ago, it was decided to do a restoration of the masterpiece and we were asked to do a computer tomography of the table just for seeing how these uh, uh, pieces were uh, nailed. <coughs> you can see the, uh, this was done at Opificio on the Pietre Dure in Florence. Uh, we, uh, we carried our instrumentation, that's in the background, there is uh, our instrumentation, the Madonna of Cardellino rotating in front of it. Before doing the uh, CT of the real object, usually we do a, so a sort of mock-up, a, a full-scale mock-up, uh, just for seeing if uh, the measurement will be successful. <coughs> that the result was, uh, did good. This, uh, was good, so uh, we did uh, the, uh, the computer tomography. Here is the uh, standard radiography, and uh, here is the tomography. <coughs> It is possible to put in evidence the Worms galleries, the wood ring, and how the table fragment were nailed, giving useful suggestion to the restorer. You see, it was evident uh, the uh, ancient restoration by the three-dimensional CT we did. Here, it is uh, the, the three steps uh, of the restoration. The first uh, it was before the restoration, with the uh, pigment added uh, during centuries uh, by uh, ancient restorers. Then uh, the second is the cleaning, total clean of the, uh, of the, of the painting. And uh, uh, now, after having uh, uh, restored by reversible uh, painting, the, uh, the part lacking, now it is uh, the uh, now it is uh, the, the, the painting you can see at Galleria Uffizi in Florence. We were very proud to have collaborated to this restoration research. Now I, have, I will, uh, <coughs> I will uh, uh, give uh, an idea of uh, uh, the, uh, the collaboration for the recovery of uh, an old globe uh, done uh, by uh, uh, famous uh, globe maker Vincenzo Coronelli. <coughs> Vincenzo Coronelli uh, was a famous uh, cartographer and globe maker lived in Venice in 18th century. In the library of Faenza, this uh, town uh, near Ravenna, there were two of these globes. You can see an ancient postcard before the, the, the war. A celestial and a terrestrial globe. A celestial and a terrestrial globe. These globes are done uh, in a couple, usually in a couple. This last globe, the terrestrial one, was destroyed by bombardment during the Second World War. As uh, it was decided to restore the celestial globe, our group was asked to do a three-dimensional CT of the globe. It was done uh, in uh, the bunker of uh, CNR in, Ravenna, in Bologna. You can see the uh, experimental uh, in the system, the globe 1.2 meters in diameter was uh, put uh, on a rotating table, there is uh, an X-ray tube, here it is uh, a, um, a scintillating screen, particularly expensive because it was uh, in the needles, uh, uh, just a needle of uh, cesium iodide, and uh, a, a glass uh, which uh, reflect uh, the image, uh, and uh, a uh, sophisticated CCD camera which acquires uh, the, the images. Now there is the experimental setup here, the photo, and you can see it is the same uh, setup used by Madonna Vocardellino in Florence. 
This is the reconstruction, very nice reconstruction of the inner part of uh, the globe. How Coronelli performed this, uh, uh, this globe. This is a wonderful uh, uh, reconstruction. I found in the uh, cantina, in the cellar, <laughs> in the cellar of uh, uh, museum, the remaining of the, the first uh, globe, the terrestrial globe. So, uh, because uh, the uh, restorer, Professor Sianna, who uh, taught here in Bologna, in Ravenna too, just the restoration uh, matter, uh, the restorer found the original maps of the globe, so it was decided to reconstruct it. This was uh, uh, the problem. The major problem was to to get money. To <laughs> reconstruction, full scale reconstruction. This is one phase of the reconstruction, and uh, uh, the uh, the wooden part is covered by uh, a gypsum, and uh, over the gypsum, but now it is a stage. Uh, advanced stage of reconstruction was put uh, the, um, the paper. The paper is a special one because uh, it is necessary to have the paper has the possibility to be uh, stretched on a sphere uh, surface and uh, it uh, was uh, given uh, free of charge <laughs> by the famous Fabrian uh, paper name. The construction is underway and uh, uh, is almost completed. Just uh, to finish my brief presentation, I will show, uh, as a last, uh, I think, uh, the uh, analysis, the 3D analysis of uh, a very big globe uh, now in uh, Palazzo Vecchio, nella Sala delle Carte, uh, done in uh, 1570 by another priest, uh, the Dominican Ignazio Danti. Ignazio Danti was a scientist working at the court of Cosimo I, the Medici, and it is uh, a famous cartographer. The opificio of the Pietre Dure asked us to do a CT. This is uh, a 2.2 meter in diameter, the biggest uh, object uh, tomographed in the world, except uh, the, the rockets <laughs> by NASA and so on. And, uh, um, well, uh, we work at, at that. And uh, we, uh, you can see how we have reconstructed the structure of the globe. And uh, uh, we found an interesting thing, uh, the uh, Meridian, are not broken as supposed, but are alternative arrived in the pole for not uh, uh, overlapping. So uh, this, uh, this globe, uh, these uh, um, media are not broken, are just uh, done uh, just for not arriving all in, in the pole, but for arriving in such a way a more uh, flexible object. It is very interesting from the point of view of the construction. For, do, uh, for dying uh, such a uh, re virtual reconstruction, we uh, had the, the possibility to do 32,000 radiographies. So uh, we uh, employed about uh, two weeks in, uh, um, in the measurement, in the in the night, uh, for not uh, disturbing the visitors, <laughs> and two months of uh, elaboration. Well, uh, in the convention of Microsoft, Microsoft see uh, our presentation more extensive than this one. It is complete our a panoramic of our work, and said, well, boys, you are good uh, for doing uh, uh, for doing a city, but uh, for, yeah, not 
to, to, do, to, to go for doing the calculation. You are rather weak to, to do. So, I give you the possibility to, uh, to use our parallel supercomputer in the United States. It was a, a, a present that uh, window that um, uh, that um, uh, the firm given to six universities in the world, five in the United States, one in Europe, ours. <laughs> well, um, by uh, using this uh, uh, parallel computer, we divided the time by a factor of 30 in the first time, and then using a new parallel computer developed here in, uh, in Emilia Romagna, in uh, Reggio Emilia, by the firm E4, now we have divided by a factor of 70. So from two months to six hours. Now, almost in real time, we can see what uh, we are doing. Because it was impossible to stay in a museum or in a gallery for two months for awaiting the results. This was uh, the measurement I had just given you a very simple, very short uh, example of what we are doing uh, and uh, what we are doing uh, about the this is the stuff of younger uh, people, half uh, girl and half boys, uh, working in our project. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Franco, for this jump in the past, uh, because we are talking about uh, the future we want. Now, well, w this is something very important for our country because it's very rich and 